Over 50 million contraceptive pills are used each day. But the pill has not lived up to its billing. It has failed to stem the tide of population growth in an increasingly overcrowded world. This film will explore the reasons why the pill, possibly the easiest, cheapest, most effective method of birth control, has failed to live up to the expectations of its creators. The paradox can be traced back to the earliest days of its development, when the work that resulted in the pill began. Early in this century, the ferret was a common laboratory animal. The female ferret becomes interested in the male only at certain times in her sexual cycle. Scientists found that this behavior has to do with natural chemicals circulating in her blood, chemicals closely related to those eventually used in the pill. They're the sex hormones. 30 years later, the role of the sex hormones was worked out in more detail. It was observed that they determine both behavior and fertility. Female baboons have a menstrual cycle about a month long. The male may pursue several females at a time, but concentrates on those whose hormone balance is at the point where they are about to release an egg. In mammals, it is the ovary that makes the two crucial sex hormones as well as the egg. One of the two, estrogen, is made in the main part of the ovary. The other, progesterone, is made by the so-called yellow body, or corpus luteum. It is the balance of the two hormones that influences sex behavior in animals and also results in the formation and release of the egg. In an early experiment, baboons were given estrogen and progesterone to change their hormone balance. In those days, one didn't quite know what the hormone was. The chemical um, constitution had not been elucidated. And uh, then one can carry on with the experiment as long as you like. In the case of the male hormone, in the experiments which I did about 1936, uh, carried on with these experiments for over 200 days, injecting them. Surprisingly, the females stopped releasing eggs. The hormone injections worked as contraceptives. No one was ready to apply this discovery to humans, including the English biologist who did the research, Sally Zuckerman. I was not interested in finding contraceptives. This is all part of basic knowledge. I was testing hypotheses. One put up a hypothesis, designed experiments to see whether or not you were on the right track or not the right track. I was merely concerned, essentially, to find out what the physiological mechanisms were which underlay the menstrual cycle, ovulation, and in the case of the monkey, of course, the dynamic uh, relationships which occurred in monkey society. Research like Zuckerman's was not to be applied to human birth control for 20 years, even though another scientist, Maurice Stokes, was the central figure in the birth control movement in England. Her primary concern was social, bettering conditions for poor mothers and children, and improving sexual relations. She opened the first British birth control clinic in 1921. Defending the principle of birth control was her main preoccupation, not exploring new contraceptive methods. In the United States, it was the same story. Here, the pioneer of the birth control movement was Margaret Sanger. And like Marie Stopes, she did not look to hormones for a new birth control method either. In the 1930s, Hormones were worth their weight in diamonds. Even for the rich, they were unavailable. Female sex hormones were seen as the wonder drugs of the future, to be used for treating cancer and infertility, not as contraceptives. For just a single dose of hormone, thousands of pigs' ovaries were needed. The purification process was complicated and very expensive. The use of hormones either for treatment or for contraceptives was simply out of the question. The work of one man changed all that. Before World War II, Professor Russell Marker developed a way of producing large amounts of hormones cheaply. But in 1949, 
having founded a multi-million dollar industry, he disappeared and was reported dead. The truth is that Russell Marker is alive and living only five minutes away from Pennsylvania State University, where he worked in the 30s. It's been 35 years since I've been here on the campus. I've uh, uh, I discontinued research about 25 years ago, and I haven't been back to my original laboratory since that time. It is in this building that I did my work on uh, the production of hormones from plant materials, especially the plant material that came from Mexico. When I came to Penn State, hormones were very scarce materials. I had an idea that these could be prepared from plant material and make them uh, practical for use in medical profession. From the sources of, of material, there weren't enough available even for uh, research by uh, medical people. So I came to Penn State and was assigned to a laboratory very similar in appearance to uh, this laboratory that you see here. This is the chemical structure of one of the sex hormones, progesterone. Marker's aim was to find a cheap source of it. The first step was the discovery in 1936 that all the sex hormones were very similar. They all belonged to the same family of chemicals called steroids. So a common source was theoretically possible. And if one could be found, it would revolutionize medicine. Marker thought that plants might be the source, and on a trip to the southern United States, he collected various specimens, including the yucca, which did contain traces of this complex chemical. Back in the laboratory, he worked out a way of chemically removing part of the structure, leaving a steroid, and from this he could make the sex hormones. So by 1939, he'd succeeded in making animal hormones from plants. But yuccas and the other plants he found yielded very little hormone. In 1936... At that time, they uh, supplied me with a botanist who was a Mexican who had a collecting permit. And we started out to uh, get this plant, but uh, because of so much difficulty that we ran into from the villagers, the botanist decided that uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with it, and we came back to Mexico. And uh, the embassy advised me to come back to the States to take the next train out in the evening. Instead of taking the train out, I, I got on a bus and I went down to uh, Orizaba, near which I could find this plant. I took a bus from Orizaba down into the jungle about 10 miles away, and there I met a man who told me that he could uh, find the plant for me if I would come back the next day. I went back the next day and got two specimens, which I brought back to Orizaba. One of them was stolen from me there, and I brought the other one back to Penn State, which was the origin of uh, the hormone industry in Mexico at the present time. The Mexican wild yam plants come in several different forms. This one's called barbasco, and like the round ones first dug up by marker, it's inedible. The plants are hidden in dense jungle, often several hundred yards apart. Mexicans still dig up the root in the same way Marker did. But now it's the starting material for a huge synthetic hormone industry. In 1941, Marker took his precious root back to the United States to try to interest drug companies in making hormones from it. Method as is used today, only now they're processed by the ton. He succeeded in making more of the pure hormone progesterone than had ever been seen before. Uh, I ended up with uh, roughly three kilos of, uh, of uh, repurified uh, progesterone. And at that time, the market price was from $80 to $100 a gram. Those six pounds of hormone from a jungle vine should have made Marker a rich man. But even with this evidence of the wild yam's value, no established company would support him. So in 1944, he and two partners founded their own company, Syntex now one of the pharmaceutical giants. 
but Marker himself was to have no share in its success. At the end of the year, when I thought the profits uh, should be distributed, I knew that there were very nice profits, including uh, the profit that was uh, obtained from uh, the first two kilos of progesterone that I had made, and I had made uh, 25 or 30 kilos during the year of uh, progesterone. It was selling for uh, uh, over $25 uh, a gram at that time. I went to uh, the senior partner in the firm and asked him about the profits, and he said there were no profits. And he eventually told me that uh, he had taken the profits as salary and there was nothing I could do about it. So I walked out of Syntex. The disillusion marker left the enormous industry he founded. In 1949, he gave up his patents and disappeared, never suspecting that his contribution to medicine would result in the pill. But while marker was starting an industry, the world had other concerns. Throughout World War II, there was no thought given to birth control, to limiting population. No research was done on contraception. With millions dead, it would have seemed absurd. Only after the war ended was the stage set for the development of the pill. Worcester, Massachusetts, 1944. Two young biologists from Clark University decided to set up an independent research institute to get away from what they considered the stuffy attitude of their academic colleagues toward their work on mental health, behavior, and hormones. One of the researchers at the new Worcester Foundation was the late Dr. Gregory Goodwin Pincus, who was to organize all the institute's work on the pill. Pincus, although a respected biologist, had previously done some controversial research while at Harvard. In an experiment with rabbits, he reported that he had managed to get eggs from the female to grow without being fertilized by the male. Not only was this field of research, sexual biology, unpopular in the atmosphere of the 30s, but the experiment also could not be repeated. Pincus moved on, first to Clark University, then to the Worcester Foundation, joining Hudson Hoagland, pictured here on the right. Hoagland and Pincus first became aware of the world's growing population problem in 1948. Hudson Hoagland is still at the Worcester Foundation. Somehow we never gave it a thought until in the late 40s, really, until after, well after World War II, uh, it had been, uh, uh, my own reactions had been catalyzed by some stuff I read, uh, population uh, bulletins that were sent out and that I found quite alarming and interesting. I could hardly believe them, but there they were. And uh, uh, Pincus was familiar with these things too. Uh, we had just never given any thought to this problem up until that time when our attention was brought by uh, various forms of, of uh, information that was in the press. But in actuality, we didn't see that anything could be done by us because uh, the question of doing research in a field of that kind was very hard to finance. Uh, we were unable to get grants from the federal government in those early years or from the big foundations because of the uh, threat to uh, the unpopularity of the subject. And uh, nobody really wanted to stick their neck out and support a project of this kind. In the state of Massachusetts, with its Puritan history and large Roman Catholic population, contraception was illegal. There was no question of support from any reputable organization. The only source of funds would be private individuals. Margaret Sanger, leader of the American birth control movement, was a friend of Hudson Hoagland. 
1951, she persuaded the heiress Catherine McCormick, a supporter of birth control, to visit the Worcester Foundation. So I called Pincus over uh, to my office, and we three sat together and talked about it. And to make a very long story short, it was she, more than anyone else, who financed the work on the pill to the tune of about $2 million over a course of about 12 years. With support assured, work could begin on the pill, work both Hoagland and Pincus hoped would provide an answer to the world population problem. Pincus brought to the Worcester Foundation in 1945 a very brilliant person in the field of reproduction, and that was M.C. Chang. Chang had received his college training in China, but he obtained a Ph.D. at Cambridge University, and he came here to work with us in 1945. It's been his work with the animals, which has been the core basis for so much of the work that uh, Pink has directed in connection with the pill. Dr. Chang still works at the Worcester Foundation on the rabbit reproductive system. When they began their work, he and Pink has wanted to make a contraceptive that would prevent the female rabbit from releasing eggs. In the normal rabbit ovary, the cavity resulting from the release of an egg becomes a yellow body, or corpus luteum, which shows on the surface of the ovary as a bump. Through an incision in the rabbit's abdomen, this can be seen. See, that's a nice corpus luteum thing there. Rabbits release several eggs at once, and each one leaves a corpus luteum behind in the pregnant rabbit. If the rabbit doesn't release any eggs and is not pregnant, there is no corpus luteum on the ovary. This procedure, the same one Chang performed in 1945, was the test of a contraceptive. Chang knew from work done with baboons and rabbits in the 1930s that sex hormones work as contraceptives if injected. But he and Pincus wanted to make an oral contraceptive and a plentiful supply of hormones was now becoming available from Mexico. After the rabbit was fed the hormones, she was mated. A few days later, the female rabbit was examined under anesthetic to see if she was pregnant. This ovary is a normal one with no corpus luteum, so it hasn't released any eggs. The dark red areas show that the eggs are still inside the ovary. The progesterone was actually working as a contraceptive when given by mouth. Chang's work was a giant step toward achieving a birth control pill for humans except for one thing. The hormone dose would have to be enormous, the equivalent of a hundred modern birth control pills a day. This problem brought Chang's work to a halt, and the story moved elsewhere. In Mexico, Syntex was expanding rapidly. Hormones were becoming important to medicine, and in 1949, the first wonder drug appeared. Cortisone and other drugs that soon followed had remarkable power to fight inflammation and could be used to treat arthritis, burns, and allergy. In 1950, a brilliant young chemist, Carl Gerasi, joined Syntex to continue the development of hormones. Gerasi became vice president of Syntex and is now professor of chemistry at Stanford University in California. His aim was to make a drug that was stronger than the natural female sex hormone, which would work by mouth at safe doses. His starting point was the five-ringed hormone progesterone from the wild yam. And here you have a masterful picture of a female sex hormone progesterone, and as far as I know, it's not only the first time I've drawn it in the sand, but in the rain as well. And that's a real first for a university professor. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'll use this bottle and put it in one very key place in the chemical structure because this female sex hormone progesterone is really nature's own contraceptive. Women do not get pregnant during pregnancy because they secrete this all the time. 
The first thing we did was to remove this part of the chemical structure represented by the bottle. This looked like a very simple change. Chemical, it was a very difficult one. In fact, that was a real novel thing that we did. The result was a hormone stronger than the natural one. He then changed the top right-hand section, shown here by a stick, to make this potent drug active by mouth at safe doses. So here was really the first highly active, orally effective uh, female sex hormone of the progesterone type. Now, we were interested at that time, first of all, for the then known medical uses of progesterone, which dealt with the treatment of infertility, which dealt with menstrual disorders, and there was some interest in treating, using progesterone for the treatment of cervical cancer. Jurassic's new sex hormone, now called norethindrone, was only one of hundreds being made at the time. Back at the Worcester Foundation in Massachusetts, 300 of them were collected by Pincus from the laboratories of major drug companies. The industry was still only interested in these hormones as drugs, but Pincus was hoping that one of them could be used to make the oral contraceptive he was trying to develop. This time, the tests on rabbits would be done with much lower doses. Each rabbit would receive a 50th of the progesterone given in the earlier tests. The tedious testing went on for years, but eventually it was rewarded. Three of the hormones, including Jurassic's, worked. The Worcester Foundation had succeeded in making an oral contraceptive. It worked in rabbits, but still had to be tested in human beings. To do this, Pincus enlisted the help of a Boston gynecologist. Now retired, Dr. John Rock recalls his early attitude toward hormones. Well, the contraceptive aspect didn't, didn't come to mind uh, until after I'd been working with the, the uh, pharmaceuticals uh, that uh, finally uh, were used, uh, because I was using them to, to uh, relieve infertility. And uh, uh, the idea was to give them the sex hormones uh, to build it, to develop the uterus, fool the uterus into thinking it was pregnant, you see, uh, and, and have it respond as if it were by growing. Uh, then stop the, the suppressing medication and let them go to it. And, and, uh, and we found that it worked to some extent. Did Dr. Rock, a Catholic, hesitate to prescribe hormones as a form of birth control? At first, it bothered me a little bit, but not very much, because by that time I had, I had done my work with, with the human embryos, and uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was not difficult for, for, for me to, to uh, uh, think that, that uh, those few little cells that, that uh, would eventually, if, if properly cultivated, uh, grow into an adult, um, were, were not really humans. Uh, they were much like all the other cells in the body. And so it seemed to me that un, 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 until the, the uh, conceptus uh, acquired uh, visible uh, characteristics of, of, uh, of a, a, a human, that it wasn't human. The spiritual thing uh, didn't bother me very much because I was dealing with tangibles, uh, tangibles, and, and uh, uh, I wasn't very, uh, I wasn't very uh, spiritual anyway at that, by that time. Uh, but it did bother me, and I, oh, I talked it over with, with uh, many church dignitaries, and fortunately. I uh, found some very uh, uh, able ones who, who more or less agreed with me. And uh, they were very helpful. So despite religion and the letter of the law, Rock's private patients in Boston were soon trying out the pill as a contraceptive. This is how it works. Swallowed, the pill goes to the intestine. 
From there, its synthetic hormone content is carried in the blood to the pituitary gland at the base of the brain. The job of the pituitary is to regulate the secretion of natural hormones in the body. What the synthetic hormones in the pill do is to interfere with the signals the pituitary normally puts out, instructing the ovary to prepare an egg and release it. So no egg is released and pregnancy cannot occur. In 1955, the International Planned Parenthood Federation held a conference in Japan. Among the speakers was the still active Margaret Sanger. Everywhere, concern about world population was growing fast. Pincus eagerly presented his first results to the conference, despite warnings from John Rock about limitations of their tests. This first public announcement of the pill was greeted merely with polite interest. It was clear that the testing had only just begun. Pincus knew the pill worked on a few women in Boston, but would it succeed in places where the population was growing rapidly? To find out, he and Rock chose an island in the Caribbean. Twenty years ago, Puerto Rico had a major population problem. With a birth rate of 40 per thousand, it was high in the world's league of expanding populations. By the 1950s, its problems of poverty and overcrowding were so bad that Operation Bootstrap was started. Money was poured in to get rid of slums and waterfront shanty towns. It was with these people, poor, uneducated, and largely unfamiliar with family planning, that Pincus wanted to test the pill. The first task would be persuading women here to accept the revolutionary new contraceptive. A task made more difficult by the fact that birth control programs of any description were a recent development. The Puerto Rican Family Planning Association employed an American doctor, Idris Rice Ray. An enthusiastic advocate, it was she who introduced many Puerto Rican women to the idea of birth control for the first time. Well, when I first came, the clinics weren't functioning very well, frankly. And you know, they didn't call them uh, family planning clinics. In fact, that word was coined later. They call them clinicus prematernales. That means clinic before maternity, because they didn't want to really say what it was, because uh, people were funny about it. It was a very delicate subject. So the nurse and I took them into another room, and uh, we started talking about um, well, how many children do you have, and how many do you have, and. How many more do you plan to have? And uh, then they began talking among themselves. Oh, I have so many, and it's such a problem, and all that. And then we would say, well, would you like to know about uh, methods not to get pregnant? You know, we have a clinic for this, and we have methods. Yes, 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 we want to know. So um, I always had a little box behind me with the various methods in it, and we would bring them out and show them. You know, this is a condom, and this is a suppository. And this is a diaphragm, and I'll explain to you how you uh, put it in. You have to be fitted and explain how it goes in and all that, you know? Now, how many of you would like to stay today and have your diaphragm fitted? Well, some of them said, uh, oh, well, I, I can't stay today, but I'd like to next time. Some of them were menstruating, and some of them were pregnant, and some of them hadn't taken a bath that day or some silly thing. But anyway, sooner or later, we got them all. And then... Uh, uh, you know, they live in these little shacks. But even so, the Puerto Ricans are very clean people. And at the end of every day, you just have to take a bath, you know. Even if you don't want to take it for being clean, you want to take it because you feel all perspiring, you know. It's pretty hot here. So they had some little place where they could put water in a can and it would sprinkle on their head. And while they were in this little place, they could put the diaphragm in, you see. So they used them very well. It was to be a severe test for Pincus's pill. Easier to use than the diaphragm, it was also easier to forget. 
1956, he approached the Family Planning Service. Well, I was just uh, down here minding my own business doing my work, and one day Gregory Pickus appeared. I think you know who Gregory Pickus is. We came down, and he was looking for somebody. He didn't, I don't think he knew me. At least I didn't know him. So he came in one day, and he had gone to the Family Planning Association to find out if there was a doctor associated with them, and I was the only doctor. So he came to see me, and he asked me if I would uh, do a study with this pill that he and Dr. Rock had developed. He said, um, it's, uh, the reason we came here is because we want to get a, a low-income, uneducated group of women, because we know women in Boston will take it. But we don't know whether women of that social group would accept it or if they would take it every day. Now, would you um, be willing to uh, put uh, 100 of these women on the pill here in Puerto Rico? Well, you know, it was a new idea. I'd never heard of the pill before, and I thought about it, and then I uh, asked a lot of questions. I had to be sure it was safe. You know, I wasn't going to give them anything that wasn't uh, all right. Well, he assured me that it was safe and that it was effective. So Dr. Rice Ray agreed. The 100 women she chose lived in this housing project. In 1956, they had just been moved here from a notorious slum called El Fanguito, or Little Mud Hole. The advantage of conducting the tests among these women was that Dr. Rice Ray could be sure they wouldn't move away. 20 years later, she returned to the place where the first major test of the pill took place. I got a social worker, and she selected women who were under 40 and had one or two children. She went to see all of them. And in order to make herself acceptable, she said, I'm uh, from the uh, Family Planning Association. You know, it's like the uh, Cancer Society or like the Infantile Paralysis Campaign. She said that so that they could relate it to something which they considered decent, you know. So then she said, uh, we have a pill that a woman can take 20 days a month, and she doesn't get pregnant. We're very much interested in parents having the right to have the number of children they want when they want to have them. Now, it just happened that most of them were very happy. They were just delighted. They couldn't get a hold of it fast enough. There was one funny little case. Uh, this woman uh, had a husband who traveled, and when he was away, she didn't take it. <laughs> so he, she only took it when he got home, and that meant just a few nights a, a month. So, of course, she got pregnant. Then a few who got breakthrough bleeding stopped the pill and got pregnant. A few... Um, their marriages broke up and things of that sort, and they got pregnant. But I want to emphasize that nobody who took the pill according to the instructions got pregnant. The test program, subject to far less regulation than would be possible today, was extended from 100 to over 20,000 women in Puerto Rico and Haiti. Although at the same time examinations were conducted to look for serious side effects, in 1960, the product called Enovid went on the market for contraceptive use. It was produced by the pharmaceutical firm G.D. Searle. I think that his interest, I think that their interest in the, in the contraceptive story was very slow in developing. They, they were concerned with other aspects of the use of endocrine substances. There are a great many ubiquitous actions these hormones have in the body. And they, when finally they knew that he was working on, the, on these things, they didn't really appreciate the that the solution was probably fairly near at hand. And uh, when they did finally discover that it was, they were somewhat alarmed on the grounds that they feared that we might uh, uh, in implicate them as an as a ethical pharmaceutical house in a controversial field, which the problem of, of uh, reproduction physiology was at that time. And this was something that I think ab bothered them. Searle was willing to take a gamble because at that time in the United States there's little doubt that many people thought that if someone came out with this sort of contraceptive or pharmaceutical company they might very well be boycotted in terms of some of the other products by, for instance, religious groups who would not favor birth control. This clearly was not the case. And uh, in retrospect, of course, it's not surprising that it was not the case. But uh, there's no question at that time, and I know examples of two pharmaceutical companies that were not prepared to touch the pill as we developed it with a 10-foot pole. Well, Searle, of course, was really going full blast. And I think they really deserve uh, a great deal of credit for that courage. And uh, in a way, I hope also it is social responsibility. 
Now, 20 years after the Puerto Rican tests, 50 million women around the world take the pill, and it's still the same basic idea developed by Pincus and his team. Used properly, there's little fear of unwanted pregnancy. There have been some changes. The pack is more sophisticated. This one has 21 active tablets, followed by seven inactive ones. A pill taken every day is easier to remember. Another change has been the reduction in the dose. In Pincus's day, this was the quantity of hormones needed to make four million pills. Now they use just one and a half pounds of active hormone. In this modern factory, the two main ingredients are handled with appropriate respect. Continuous exposure to hormone dust would cause male workers to develop female characteristics. Most of each pill is this, an inactive powder. The active hormones are only a few grains in each tablet. Active and inactive powders are mixed up together. The manufacture of oral contraceptives is now a thriving industry. In the United States, seven major pharmaceutical houses make over $400 million a year from sales of birth control pills alone. They're offered in 30 different varieties with several types of synthetic hormone and a range of doses. But when Dr. Rice Ray first gave it out in Puerto Rico, there was only one type. Mrs. Garcia has been using that type for the 20 years since then. She's been on the pill longer than any other woman in the world. Before the testing began, Mrs. Garcia gave birth to six children. Since then, she's had none. She feels that the pill has helped her become a more prosperous and happy person. The developers of the pill hope by now that Mrs. Garcia's fortune would be shared by hundreds of millions of women worldwide, enough to solve the problems of overcrowding and population growth. But it's not. World population is still growing fast. Why has the pill failed to live up to expectations? One reason might be side effects. Taken by mouth, the impact of the pill is felt throughout the body. Nausea and weight gain are relatively common, blood clotting and hypertension much more rare and the possibility of a relationship between the pill and cancer is under investigation. But there's been a steady rise in sales, despite the annoying side effects, so the reason why the pill has failed to control world population growth must be more fundamental. The People's Republic of China, with more than 800 million people, is the most populous country on Earth. But according to available data, China, in the last 10 years, has cut its birth rate in half. In urban areas, oral contraceptives are the most popular form of birth control among women who have not completed their families. The Chinese have developed their own technology for the manufacture of pills. This machine, small and compact, makes pills which are chemically identical to those in the West, but more cheaply packaged, stored, and distributed. Carl Jurassi. As an example here, they use exactly the same chemical that we have in the pills, but uh, uh, actually absorb it on water-soluble paper uh, with a little stamp. So this would be a month's supply. And you see on the back of it here the instructions to the patient, to how to use them, and even give the dosage in there. And then all the woman does is uh, tear off one of these stamps, put it in your mouth, and uh, chew it and swallow it. In China, working couples must often live apart for long periods of time and there's a particular type of birth control pill to suit their needs. The visiting pill is taken every month on the fifth day of the cycle, and again only when sexual relations occur. 
It's not yet available in the United States, though testing of similar products is underway. But the availability of oral contraceptives is only one factor in lowering birth rate. The really key thing in China is really the, the social approach, the social, cultural, uh, even political approach to birth control, which is very subtle, all pervasive, and it's perhaps the only thing that really made it possible for them in a matter of really less than 10 years to uh, institute an uh, enormous family planning program on a scale unheard of anywhere else in the world in a country that really didn't practice birth control before to an extent. A lot of people ask, of course, uh, if China can do it, can, for instance, India do it, or other large, less developed countries? My own answer would be no. The reason is that none of them share China's unique social and political system. And that system, more than contraceptive techniques, is what has led to China's success in lowering birth rate. Part of the system is a planned birth program. Contraceptives are given out free to married women in an informal way by barefoot doctors in factories throughout city neighborhoods as well as rural areas. And China has a low rate of infant mortality. Experience shows this is necessary before people are willing to limit their families. But essentially different in China are social and political controls that ensure small family size. These include late marriage, not before age 25, virtually no premarital sex, and pressure on married couples from their neighbors and colleagues to have only two children. Only in combination with these factors have oral contraceptives helped lower China's birth rate. What contribution can the pill make to population control in other developing societies? As in China, family planning services in Puerto Rico distribute birth control pills free, and the birth rate has rapidly declined. But there, the similarity ends. Puerto Rico has a capitalist economy closely tied to the United States. The Puerto Rican family planning system is well organized and extensive. These social workers operate from a town in the middle of the island and spend much of their time going out to see women who don't visit the town's family planning clinic. Part of the money to pay for this service comes from the island's own economy, but most of it comes from the United States. In total, about $5 million a year goes to the family planning service. Puerto Rico has 600,000 women of childbearing age. Some of them are treated by private physicians. A third have been sterilized at their own request. Sterilization has traditionally been a popular form of contraception on the island. That leaves just over 250,000 women to be treated by the Family Planning Service. To contact them in areas like this, the starting point is the local store. Here they'll know where the families with children are living. Then it's up to the social workers to get there on foot. The woman this social worker is seeing today has been to the clinic where she was examined and given birth control pills. But for some reason, the distance into town perhaps, she didn't return. So the social worker brings her a new supply of pills. She is just one of thousands of women throughout the island who are now limiting the size of their families. Puerto Rico's birth rate is declining and prosperity is on the rise. Puerto Rico is unlike China in virtually every way, politically, economically, socially. What is responsible for the decline in birth rate here? In charge of family planning for the government, Dr. Silva Iglesia. I would say that primarily it has been socioeconomic development. I would not, I would like to think that it was family planning, but 
They could not honestly say it was family planning because family planning really didn't come into the picture until the middle 50s. And then not even on a very major scale, only a small private institution was furnishing methods of birth control in the middle 50s. So I would say that primarily the birth rate has dropped in Puerto Rico due to the intensive socioeconomic development program that the government has undertaken since 1940. So the availability of the pill has not been the major cause of the declining birth rate here either. But both Puerto Rico and China are developing societies. What about the industrial nations? Birth rates in the industrial world started a steady decline about a hundred years ago. Even without modern contraceptive methods, economic development prompted couples to limit the size of their families. Now most developed countries have low birth rates except in a few inner city areas. The conditions in parts of Glasgow, Scotland are similar in some respects to those in the developing world. Here there are large numbers of poor people who do not use family planning even if it's available. Dr. Elizabeth Wilson has found that the only way to bring contraceptives to this housing development is to visit the women at home, even though there's a clinic only a mile and a half away. Why don't the women use the clinic? They're afraid that the pill's going to do them harm. They're afraid that um, if they have an IUD, they're going to bleed to death. They're afraid of all sorts of things. Very often you don't even know what they're afraid of until you get to know them quite well. And then it may be something which they've been afraid to put into words before. Today, Dr. Wilson is visiting one of the women at the project to give her a new long-acting contraceptive administered in the form of an injection. Known here as a JAG, it's made of a progesterone derivative called Depo-Provera. It's on the market in 50 countries, but not in the United States, where the Food and Drug Administration hasn't approved it. Mrs. McIntyre has got several more children than most of her neighbors. We were asked to see her shortly after she'd had her ninth baby. She's now quite certain that she doesn't want to have any more babies, even though she's only 33. McIntyre, I thought it was about time you had another jag. Have you been thinking about it? Well, I've been deep in thought. You have. Well, Would you rather have the pill this time? No, the pill. I never found a pill. Yeah. I felt pregnant. Was that... Catherine. Did you forget it? The injection deposits the steroid into muscle tissue, which slows down its release into the bloodstream and spreads it out over a period of three or four months, depending on the dose. One problem with this technique is that at first, the hormone is delivered into the blood at a very high rate, much more than needed to prevent ovulation. Another difficulty is that it takes some women up to a year to conceive, should they decide to stop the injections and try to become pregnant. Despite these and other disadvantages, Dr. Wilson has been prescribing the JAG for four years and thinks it's the best option for many women. The great advantage of the injection is that it lasts for three or four months, depending on the size of the dose that we give. So it doesn't depend on the patient having to remember to do anything about it. It's a very painless injection, and it has very few disadvantages. The main one being that sometimes people do miss their periods, and occasionally they perhaps bleed a little bit more than they would like to. But Otherwise, we find it a very satisfactory method and very acceptable to most people who try it. Good. Well, I'll be back again in about four months' time to give you the next one. Again? Yes, I hope you haven't changed your mind. No. Good old. Well, Two doors away are Mrs. Marshall and Mrs. Bowers. Mrs. Bowers, have you ever thought about going down to the clinic at Glenbar Street? No. Haven't. You don't really want to go? No. Any special reason? Some people do find it very difficult to go to clinics. Sometimes it's the white coats and the s smell of antiseptic and 
don't like getting undressed in front of people and the general atmosphere of being rather ordered about and authoritarian sort of atmosphere. I think another thing is that an awful lot of women really don't like being examined and most people who go to clinics know that they're almost certainly going to be asked to be examined uh, and they don't like to be asked and they don't like to refuse so they'd rather not go at all. Get there. Do you think you might go then? Not you. <laughs> Attitudes like these reveal not that the pill is inadequate but that the expectations that accompanied its development were unrealistic. The pill is an easy, cheap, effective means of birth control but it's not a panacea. When it first became possible, it was seen as a certain solution to the world's growing population problem. Now we know there are no such easy answers. 20 years of experience have shown that family size is influenced by much more powerful forces than the availability of any birth control technique. By political and economic systems, social customs and religion, affluence and poverty. The number of children men and women choose to have is determined not only by a mixture of hormones, but by every aspect of their lives. The presentation of this program was made possible in major part by public television stations. Additional support was provided by unrestricted general program grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation, and by grants from Exxon Corporation and the National Science Foundation. Um.